Let's go on to Aldol additions. We're stepping back to section three now. Um, and let's remember uh, that when an aldehyde is treated with hydroxide or an alkoxide, the equilibrium forms where a significant amount of both enolate and aldehyde are present, right? So using hydroxide or any other methoxide, ethoxide is an equilibrium reaction um, to create the enolate. Now, if the enolate attacks the aldehyde that's still present, then an aldol reaction occurs. So we are going to be using um, a weak uh, base here. A sodium hydroxide is common. Um, methoxide is fine. Ethoxide is fine as well. Why we are doing that is because both the enolate and aldehyde are present and we want two equivalents of our aldehyde to react. One in the enolate form and the other in the aldehyde form. And we create a new alpha beta bond in this reaction. And we create um, at this point, we'll see that it is a beta hydroxy aldehyde. The product features both the aldehyde and the alcohol group, which is why it's called aldol. Uh, the location of the alcohol group will always be on that beta carbon. Under basic conditions, an enolate is the reactive intermediate. So this is always going to be done under basic conditions. So in that first step, we'll do a proton transfer where we attack the alpha carbon to pop a lone pair on that alpha. And then this is where it's in equilibrium with other aldehydes. We take a second equivalent of aldehyde and we can do a reaction at the carbonyl that carbonyl is going to become the beta of the product. So alpha beta bond is formed in that second step, the nucleophilic attack. And then proton transfer to make the beta hydroxy. The aldol addition is an equilibrium process. So uh, most often simple aldehydes um, produce the aldol product is favored. Um, for most ketones, the aldol product is not favored. Um, and so there is a reverse mechanism that is um, able to occur as well. What we do to mitigate the reverse reaction or the retroaldol reaction is um, actually use um, a condensation reaction. Now, typically we will see that these condensation reactions, we are going to do them under basic conditions. You can do them under acidic conditions, but we're gonna deal with just basic conditions. Now, an aldol condensation reaction has a little bit extra to it. An alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone is formed. So these alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl forms will be uh, our products. And it's because heat is going to be added. We're driving off water in this reaction. So an aldol condensation occurs when an aldol addition is performed and then we elevate the temperatures. We do it at very, very high temperatures. Water will be driven off. Um, aldol condensation um, is, is better for us because it is irreversible. Um, so where aldol addition, which was sodium hydroxide in water, produced the beta hydroxy aldehyde, simple aldehydes work with this, ketones, not so much. The aldol condensation works for aldehydes or ketones, and the only addition that we have is heat to make that alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone, and it's irreversible. So let's go ahead and look at that mechanism. We're gonna start at the whole thing, all right? So starting with aldol addition and then follow it up with the elimination of water. Aldol addition, let's go ahead and deprotonate that alpha carbon. Let's do our nucleophilic attack to add on our beta position. There's that new alpha and beta bond. And then we will protonate our oxygen on the beta carbon to produce the alpha beta 
um, or the, excuse me, beta hydroxy aldehyde. Then for the elimination of water, a second equivalent of hydroxide is going to be used to make another enolate. Um, still same pKa, right? So we can still deprotonate that in an equilibrium reaction. Just now in basic conditions, we have a loss of a leaving group. We complete that uh, elimination style reaction where the hydroxide is ejected um, to create the product, the alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. Um, when cis and trans or E and Z is formed, Typically, uh, we will only show the major product, which is the trans form or E stereochemistry. Because the aldol condensation is favored, it's often impossible to isolate uh, the aldol addition product. Um, and so really uh, how we would even want to think about only forming the aldol addition product is at ultra low temperatures. So 10 degrees Celsius, um, we can get 20% product. We probably don't ever want to do that. I hope at this point in your academic and organic chemistry career, you're looking at 20% as like, that's probably not good. Um, so typically we, we usually only do aldol condensation reactions at high temperatures. We get much better yields. We can have crossed aldol reactions where we have a mixture of two different aldehydes and ketones um, to, to create the desired product. Um, it's called crossed aldol or sometimes called mixed aldol. The problem is if you just throw in two different aldehydes or two different ketones, um, you can get a maximum of four different products. Like look at all these different products. Like why would we want this? Um, this is probably not a good idea, right? To just throw them in. So we do need a controlled setup. Um, when would crossed aldol reactions be helpful? Well, they're only practical um, if the number of products can be minimized, okay? So it's achieved in one of two ways. First way, if one of the reactants, the substrates, is relatively unhindered and without alpha protons. So this would be uh, formaldehyde is a great electrophile because it's unhindered. Uh, there's not a lot of bulk around this carbon, which would become the beta carbon right? And also there's only one alpha on all of these carbon uh, molecules. There's only one alpha position. So there's only one enolate that could technically form. So what we see is that um, the only uh, compound that can form an enolate is at this position, right? We would see that enolate form and then attack Again, here's another one. Attack another aldehyde that does not have the ability to form an enolate. That can either be formaldehyde or it can be benzaldehyde here where the alpha position is not valid because there's no hydrogens there, all right? Um, if you use LDA as a base, it's called directed aldol addition. So you take one aldehyde or ketone, you react it First, step number one with LDA, that forms the enolate that you desire. Then step number two, you sprinkle in the aldehyde or ketone that you want to cross with it, right? And then that forms that beautiful alpha beta new bond. And then you can um, either uh, use heat and water or you can, um, you can try and, and, and achieve the, the aldol uh, the aldol addition reaction only. Um, if you add heat, then you would do the alpha beta carbon carbon double bond product. All right. So one carbon is completely converted to enolate with LDA. That is the irreversible enolate formation. And then the other carbonyl compound is then slowly added in, just sprinkle that in like sprinkles on top. Yeah intramolecular reactions can definitely form cyclic compounds here. Um, 
usually it's only going to do it if you have a five or six membered ring. Um, one group forms the enolate that attacks the other group. So typically symmetrical molecules are utilized. Um, and again, alpha of one can then go and attack the carbon of the other carbonyl. And so one, two, three, four, five in between those two positions. One here was alpha, two, three, four, five. Here's beta for the unsaturated position. Klies and condensation reactions are very, very similar to aldol condensation reactions. The only difference is that we are going to use esters. Um, esters also undergo reversible condensation addition reactions. Um, and so we tend to try to use um, a Klies and condensation um, that is simple. All right, so it is going to look like a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction. Again, chapter 20, just right here in the forefront of our mind uh, when we're looking at uh, an enolate nucleophile attacking an electrophile. Um, so Kleising condensation reactions, um, the nucleophile will be the enolate of the ester, and then the electrophile will be a second equivalent of ester. Just like we had two equivalents of aldehyde or ketones in aldol reactions, we can have two equivalents of esters. What forms is a beta keto ester. Notice here that H3O plus workup. This is an acid workup because we are forming a beta keto ester, which is an extremely acidic position, right? pKa of around 10. And so we need an acid workup to make sure that at the end of the day, our alpha position is protonated and our molecule desired is neutral, not another enolate. So let's go ahead and walk through this reaction. It will look very, very similar. We tend to use an alkoxide here, one that will match in our groups to the ester. That way we won't get any competition with um, esterification reactions. That would not be fun. We want to react here at the alpha position. We form an enolate and then the alpha carbon will attack another esters carbon of the carbonyl, which we will call beta. Awesome. And then Instead of protonating this oxygen on the beta position, what actually happens is the acyl substitution reaction. We kick out OR minus one. We can do that here in this reaction because we are in a base and it is the same base as the leaving group. And so therefore the alpha beta position um, is going to be a beta ketone, right? And we still have our original ester. Now we do have a last proton transfer step because now we have created an alpha carbon that is more acidic. So this is our final product after step number one. It is the deprotonated alpha position um, and it's doubly stabilized by both carbonyls. So it's extremely stable. Now, the last step um, is what drives the reaction to completion. So you do have to show that even though you're like, Lauren, come on, I'm just gonna put that proton back on. No, that is the last step that is driving the reaction forward. An acid workup is necessary in step number two so that we can isolate our neutral product so that we can pop the proton back up on that alpha position. Um, but it is really important to know why we have that acid workup. Some limitations to Kleisen, the starting ester must have two alpha protons because removal of the second proton by the alkoxide ion is what drives the reaction forward. Um, so hydroxide, uh, oh, and so if we did not drive that reaction forward with the last deprotonation step, we wouldn't get the Kleisen reaction. Hydroxide cannot be used as the base um, because of what we uh, noted before, we'd get competition with uh, acyl substitution um, with the original compound itself. And so instead of an ester, we'd form a carboxylic acid and then we'd neutralize all of our molecules by making the carboxylate ion and we don't wanna do that. So choose a base that is the alkoxide that matches your ester alkoxide. Last limitation here, 
is looking at uh, that alkoxide site that matches. Um, otherwise, transesterification could happen too. So it's not only just using an alkoxide site that's important, it's using an alkoxide site that matches. We don't want this reaction to occur where we have competition for our enolate formation with transesterification. We just don't want that. Why would we want to compete? So if you have OET as your ester, use OET minus one as the base. Very, very simple. Match it up. cross Kleisen are also useful if, again, very certain criteria is met. One ester has no alpha protons. Again, keep it simple. Or again, we can use direct Kleisen condensation with LDA, very similar to what we just saw with our aldol condensations that were crossed. Intramolecular Kleisen actually just have a very fancy name. It's called the Dieckmann cyclization. Like aldol reactions, this cyclization prefers five and six membered rings. It occurs the exact same way. We form the exact same style things alpha beta or beta keto esters.